Next, we have Brenda Galdenzi, the president of Protect Our Wildlife. Welcome, Ms. Galdenzi. Hello, let me just start the video here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Brenna Galdenzi, president of Protect Our Wildlife, an all volunteer Vermont nonprofit wildlife advocacy organization with over 2,500 Vermont supporters from every corner of the state, including hunters, anglers, seventh generation Vermonters, uh, and I'm proud to be here today to represent their interests. Uh, thank you, Chair Sheldon, for the invitation uh, to testify today. And I thank you, uh, committee members, uh, for your time. Um, I'd like to start off with Bill H-172, um, and um, I should be just under 30 minutes for all three bills. Um, so I'd like to begin my testimony today with a quote from a Vermont hunter uh, that was shared with me over a decade ago. And this Vermont hunter uh, opposes trapping. And he said to me, there is no one at the other end of a trap pulling the trigger. And that statement really is the fundamental difference between hunting and trapping. Um, an ethical hunter knows what he or she is shooting before pulling the trigger. They know the difference between a buck or a spike horn or a doe or someone's dog. Traps don't offer that level of discretion. In fact, they offer no discretion at all. A baited hunk of metal that is set in the woods, including our shared public lands and national wildlife refuges, not only attracts the targeted species, whether it's a gray fox or a bobcat or any other animal, that trap also attracts and catches protected species and people's pets. It happens every year in Vermont. However, due to the fact that trappers are not required to report non-targeted wildlife, it is very difficult to know how many of these animals actually endured uh, life-threatening injuries or who died. We only know of these incidents through public records requests to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And we obtain info uh, that ended up in their case records. Um, one of the more recent cases was a hunter who noticed uh, a red-tailed hawk and a great blue heron who were found dead, um, just their legs were remaining, in beaver traps uh, set in Dorset. Uh, other non-targeted species that are caught in Vermont uh, that we found in public records, I'm just gonna list a few, snowshoe hares, turkeys, ravens, bald eagles, black bears, barred owls, screech owls, Canada geese, endangered pine marten, and other animals, again, including people's pets. Some research indicates that as many as 18 non-targeted animals may be captured for every targeted animal. And that depends upon the type of trap used, the bait or lures that are used and other variables. So as the committee evaluates this legislation, I ask you to please consider the three following questions. Is trapping ethical? Is trapping a wildlife mm -hmm. management tool? Is trapping supported by Vermonters? No, trapping is not ethical. I understand that what is or is not ethical is subjective. But if I could spend my entire testimony simply sharing photos and videos, and I've been asked to do that, but I'm not doing that, um, I think the answer would be a resounding, no, trapping is not ethical. It does not matter really whether we are Republican or Democrat or from the city or from the country. We are human beings who possess empathy. And when you see the images of trapped animals or videos of trapped animals, nothing else in my testimony really matters. We have countless files and photos of Vermont wildlife suffering in traps. And I have just a 20 second video um, that I've received permission to share. There he is. He's a little angry. Are you mad? <laughs> Better show us a bobcat. <laughs> Bear with me here. There he is. So 
But we cannot talk about trapping without talking about cruelty. The main difference again between hunting and trapping is that traps are inherently designed to inflict prolonged suffering. Even if a leg hold trap is operating 100% as designed, which they rarely do, that trap causes a trapped animal to suffer for long periods of time. What ethical hunter do you know would be okay with intentionally causing prolonged suffering to a deer and then killing that animal a day later by bludgeoning it or strangling it or other legal methods of killing trapped wildlife? I'd say not one hunter, or at least the hunters that I know. The evidence of trapped animals show bloody paws, broken bones and teeth from chewing at the trap, predation by other animals while immobilized in traps, among other cruelties. It is the stark reality of trapping, and I challenge the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department to refute that fact. I have, again, files of photos and videos of Vermont animals and that's the easy route is to come here and testify and spend the entire 10 minutes showing you photos and videos. And I'm not going to do that. I'm hoping um, to put a narrative behind it. Some animals like raccoons and foxes are more inclined to chew at the trap and their limbs to free themselves, which results in gnawing off their own paws. This was evidenced uh, in Windsor, Vermont, where a young raccoon was found in a shallow pool of water with her not off limb. She did not escape the trap. She died a long, painful, unnecessary death. Animal suffering and the ethics of trapping does not seem to be of major importance to Vermont Fish and Wildlife trapping specialist Kim Royer. In a March 10th interview in The Bridge from last year, I quote, more important than how much each individual animal suffers in a trap is Fish and Wildlife's mission to engage people with the outdoors. While there's a lot of attention around the animal while it's trapped, there is rarely ever any discussion around how these animals are killed. There are no requirements in Vermont as to how an animal must be killed. Trappers bludgeon, strangle, oftentimes with the catch pole, place a kill trap over the trapped animal's head, stomp on the animal's chest to crush its heart and lungs, drown the animal or shoot the animal. And the latter isn't always used because they don't wanna ruin the pelts, with a bullet hole. And I've heard some chatter from trappers uh, recently complaining, not wanting to waste a bullet because of ammunition shortage and the cost of ammunition. There is a reason why Fish and Wildlife never shows you photos or videos of trapped animals, either on their social media pages or any of their newsletters. In fact, in their fur bearer newsletter, they coach trappers how to pose with trapped animals and they encourage uh, photos not to be shared at all. Number two, trapping is not a wildlife management tool. A device as non-selective as a leg hold or a kill trap can never be considered an effective tool to manage wildlife when that tool cannot differentiate between a coyote, a bald eagle, or someone's dog. The only animal that fish and wildlife ever seems to use as rationale for trapping is the beaver. And Bill H-172 allows for the trapping of animals causing damage to property. So landowners, municipalities are able to still trap. So that red herring has already been addressed effectively. Our neighboring state of Massachusetts has a ban on recreational trapping that has an exemption for beavers. This means that only those beavers, a keystone, speci a keystone species that are causing damage that cannot be remedied non-lethally may be trapped and killed. This means greater ecosystem health and biodiversity it's a win for the people of Massachusetts and a win for wildlife. They don't have bobcats, otters, foxes, and other wildlife starving, as some trappers might have you believe. Again, Kim Royer, the biologist from Vermont Fish and Wildlife who runs the trapping program, admits that trapping that bobcats do not need to be hunted or trapped in an email that she sent to one of our members dated February 25th of this year. I quote, Bobcats are not typically a species whose population has to be managed through hunting or trapping, as we do with species like deer or beaver, end quote. Additionally, when interviewed by the bridge in March of 2020 and asked if Fish and Wildlife considers trapping an important part of controlling wildlife populations in Vermont, Royer said, 
Not an important part, no. Trappers claim that trapping prevents species from overpopulating and reduces disease. But those same trappers kill coyotes and bobcats and other vital predators who by nature's design don't overpopulate. And those very animals are the key predators who keep other animals' populations in check. So meso predators like red fox and raccoon, these apex predators in Vermont, coyotes and bobcats, uh, are actually doing what nature intended. So their, ar their argument uh, at its very foundation is flawed. Also several, studies, uh, also, several studies show that transmission of mange is not density dependent. Rather, it is frequency dependent, meaning it depends upon the per capita contact rate between susceptible and infected individuals. I've shared that study under separate cover. Trapping generally removes healthy individuals from the population rather than the sick, sick aged or very young animals, most often subjected to natural selection. It would be simply blind luck if a trapper were to trap an animal that would have otherwise died of starvation or any other natural cause. So trapping actually works against nature selection process. Modern conservation understands that biodiversity and ecosystem health and function is best managed by protecting natural processes and cycles. Number three, trapping is not supported by most Vermonters. According to the following 2017 uh, survey question conducted by University of Vermont Center for Rural Studies, the question was, should Vermont ban the use of steel jawed leg hold, body gripping traps, and any types of drowning traps? The majority of Vermonters said yes, trapping should be banned. What has happened recently is that trapping lobbyists have tried to garner support for trapping by telling hunters that groups like Protect Our Wildlife and some of our colleagues are going to come after hunting and fishing if we ban trapping. And that is simply untrue. It's scare tactics and it's not helpful. And to hear trappers hijack the term minority status and demand to be fairly represented is disrespectful to those who have been truly marginalized in our state and across our country. Minority status is not only about numbers, it's about an imbalance of power. Trappers are a privileged user group. They have the support of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and many board members. It's also interesting to share uh, that in a public records request that we received earlier this year, Chris Saunders from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Depart Department was surprised to learn via a recent survey that the department did that older rural Vermont women had a higher disapproval rating of trapping than he had anticipated. So really it is not a flatlander versus a rural opinion. In closing, Trappers use the tradition argument to justify trapping. But just because an activity was done 200 years ago, it does not mean that we should continue doing it. I think that is a slippery slope. There was a tradition of bounties on bobcats in Vermont. There is a long list of American traditions that are no longer acceptable and for good reason, and trapping is no different. Hunting a wild animal as humanely as possible for, sus for subsistence with respect for the life taken is supported by many, including our organization. Trapping is not that. 10 states, including Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Hawaii, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Washington state, and as of yesterday, New Mexico, in 85 countries have either severely restricted trapping or banned trapping altogether. Chair Sheldon, should I go on to bear hounding or should I take questions? I think um, it would be good to go on. Okay, on to bear hounding. Uh, we oppose the use of hounds to pursue and hunt bears for these three key reasons. It is unethical and violates fair chase tenets of hunting. It is akin to animal fighting where hunters are pitting one animal, the bear, against six powerful, tenacious, well-fed hounds. Bears do not always tree, and when they stand their ground to fight the hounds, it places both the hounds and the bears in danger. This is only exacerbated by the fact that hounders are often miles away from their hounds in their pickup trucks with their handheld GPS devices and are unable to manage the confrontations. This comment is from, 
this comment is from a Vermont bearhounded post bearhounder posted on a public Facebook page. Treat a small cub today. We ran the mom, but she only wanted to fight. Here's another comment from a different Vermont hounder. My hounds ran and fought this bear for seven hours. He bit two dogs and had no intentions of stopping. I have some sore dogs, but alive. And I have copies of all of these comments and others to any committee members who request them. Hounds pursue bears starting on June 1st when cubs are still very small and bears are in compromised physical condition. The bears expend vital calories, fat reserves and hydration all for the hounders recreation. This training season runs through September 1st, which marks the start of bear hunting, including the use of hounds. The hounders can run their hounds again on bears starting on September 1st, right through the end of November. Even if they've already killed a bear during the legal bear hunting season, they can still continue to run their hounds on bears. So bears are pursued for close to six long months in Vermont. They are terrorized in the woods where we want them for the hounders recreation. These hounds present a threat to deer fawn, moose calves, brown nesting birds, and whatever other animal they come across. Number two, hounding violates Vermonters' constitutional right to protect our property. People can post their land to the letter of the law, but due to the uncontrolled nature of hounding, hounds end up on private property every year. Hounds place people, domestic pets, and property at risk. Every year we receive emails and phone calls from desperate Vermonters who feel helpless to protect their property from marauding hounds. Commissioner Lewis Porter's perennial response to these complaints is, dogs can't read post-it signs. The main justification we hear from the Fish and Wildlife Department is that hounds help to haze problem bears. That is only a very small percentage of the hounding activity that lasts for six long months in Vermont. We challenge that, ju that justification. Multiple studies have concluded that hazing methods are only temporary and managing food attractants are the best way to reduce bear conflicts. While testifying to the Agricultural Committee on February 10th of this year on damage to cornfields, Fish and Wildlife's bear biologist, Forrest Hammond shared, I quote, the year that you're going to have damage is predictable. It's every other year and it's even numbered years. It's a short time frame, usually lasts about a month from mid-August to mid-September. Farmers who have their cornfields where it's surrounded by highways, houses, and fields, those fields have very few problems. So choosing where you plant your corn, perhaps a rotational planting and maybe planting in another crop in the most problem fields in the even numbered years would make a difference. And I really appreciate that because that shows that we are evolving in our thinking and how we manage bear conflicts. The majority of the problems with bears in Vermont is due to backyard food attractants, such as compost, bird feeders, and unsecured chicken coops. If we can change human behavior, then we could solve our problem. Electric fencing offers the highest chance of successfully keeping bears out. Other effective methods of hazing include signal cartridges, such as flares, that are also very practical, inexpensive, and easy to use. Air horns, paintball guns, and other deterrents have also proven effective. Also worth mentioning is that there's other studies, uh, recent studies, that in the presence of hunting dogs and with the onset of hunting season, black bears who are extremely intelligent will migrate towards paved roads to buffer from hunters and their dogs. Therefore, more frequent human bear interactions may occur as bears leave the woods where we want them and enter roadways. This movement also results in more frequent road crossings, especially at night when risk of vehicle collision is high. So for these three key reasons, we oppose bear hounding. And uh, there are studies to support uh, many of the claims in this paper. Shall I go on to wanton waste or would you like? Sure, go on. Um, so I'm gonna keep this particular part of my testimony fairly short because there's been exhaustive testimony on this already. Um, and I've testified this in previous years, both on the Senate and the House side. But I can't think of a more credible, credible advocate for a ban on wanton waste than a retired game warden 
um, who is able to speak freely, uh, Don Isabel is a retired warden who tried to pass a wanton waste prohibition via the Fish and Wildlife Board back in 2018. And in his letter to the board, he documented the wanton waste of muskrat, coyotes, deer, turkey, and other wildlife. And uh, Warden Isabel is actually a trapper. In addition, in 2009, a survey of Vermont game wardens revealed that hunters and anglers were not consistent with their efforts to retrieve fish and wildlife. The department estimated that as many as 60 to 100 wanton waste events occurred each year, many of which were very apparent to the public. In response, the department supported a ban on wanton waste at that time, but the effort eventually fell apart in front of the Fish and Wildlife Board. So it is clear that uh, this and many other efforts will not be accomplished uh, via the rulemaking process. So in short, this bill simply says that if you are going to hunt or trap a wild animal during the legal season, that the meat should be eaten and the fur should be utilized. What ethical sportsman would oppose that? There are fair exemptions for diseased animals or animals damaging property. There are even exemptions for acceptable hunting practices. A wanton waste law only applies to the intentional act of hunting and trapping a wild animal and to be certain that that animal is utilized. I've seen countless examples of crows being used as target practice or coyotes who were shot and left to rot in the woods where they were killed. We see this often in the May turkey season where hunters will kill a coyote just because they can. And this, type of, and this time of year is especially concerning um, because they could be rearing pups. So while we would have preferred to see coyotes included in the utilization section of this bill, um, that was an area of compromise um, that we made. And I think the current bill that is in front of you is hopefully uh, a bill that uh, all stakeholder groups can agree on. Um, and lastly on this, uh, the UVM Center for Rural Studies did a Vermonter poll survey question. Um, and the survey question was, Vermont wildlife policies allow certain species, including coyotes, crows, porcupines, skunks, and weasels to be killed without limit, even when there was no intent to consume or use the remains. This is called wanton waste killing. Should Vermont wildlife policies prohibit the wanton waste of wildlife? except when these animals are causing damage to property or agricultural products. And a resounding majority uh, supported a wanton waste ban and uh, a wanton waste ban. And Michael Moser from uh, UVM Center for Rural Studies would be, I'm sure, happy to explain the survey methodology uh, to anyone who is asking. Chair, would it be helpful just to show photos of some wanton waste examples or no? Well, uh, I want to make sure there's time for questions. So I, I, I guess I leave it to you, but I, I don't know how much more you have to do to get okay. to it. So. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I'll go on to the last bill. This is also fairly short. Uh, H316, an act relating to control over hunting dogs. Uh, this bill addresses the public safety hazard attributable to bear hounding. The public should not be afraid to recreate on our public lands or in their own backyards on their posted property. Bear hounders, who are another privileged group, I would argue, place the general public in danger. We would like to see bear hounding banned outright in H172. But if that does not happen, then at the very least, hounders should have visual and verbal control over their hounds. As more and more families are recreating outdoors on our public lands, including national wildlife refuges, do we want to wait until another tragedy happens or someone's pet is killed before we take action? Some of you might remember what happened in Ripton, Vermont back in October of 2019, where bear hounds attacked a retired couple and their leashed puppy um, who required veterinary care. The attack persisted for over 30 minutes and that's because the hounder was miles away in his pickup truck unable to manage the confrontation. And this is common practice with hounders. Uh, Representative Morris had a great question um, when this came up a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I wish I could have responded at that time and I couldn't, but I, I wrote it down. And uh, hounders do not have to prove to anyone, to the wardens, to Fish and Wildlife, 
that their hounds are indeed trained before unleashing them into the woods, either during the hound training season or the legal bear hunting season. If the hounds end up chasing and injuring a deer fawn or other non-targeted animal, again, the hounder is not there to intervene and correct the hounds. So I don't know how that's training your dog. As someone who has two powerful, large dogs, I would never imagine unleashing them into the woods unsupervised for hours and not being in control over them. If my dogs were to chase a deer in the woods, they could be shot by a game warden. Yet Fish and Wildlife endorses bear hounding that invites this very unwanted activity. So why does this privileged user group get a free pass? Um, and one other thing I was thinking about this morning, um, you know, key differences between bear hounding and other types of using dogs to hunt. Um, I talked to a friend of mine um, who hunts snowshoe hare with beagles. And I guess the snowshoe hares run in circles um, and will jump out of the circle and the beagles keep running in a circle. So um, number one, you know, you don't have such a large animal that's gonna present a, a clear danger to the dogs like a bear. Uh, number two, it seems to me that the chases um, with other types of animals, you know, don't last for hours. Um, and you're not pitting, you know, a, a large carnivore, a bear, you know, against hounds and end up injuring or killing your hound um, and also potentially injuring and harming uh, the public. So that's all I have. And I'm happy to take any questions anyone might have. Thank you. Uh, do members have questions? Representative Lefebvre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Brenda, for your testimony. Um, I have a couple of questions, and I, one of the first ones I have, the first one I have is based on uh, your assertion that uh, most Vermonters don't support trapping, which is, as I understand it, is the, is the uh, conclusion based on a 2017 survey. Is that right? Yes, it was a University of Vermont's Center for Rural Studies survey. It was their Vermonter poll and Protect Our Wildlife uh, inserted or asked them to uh, present that question in their Vermonter poll. What was the sampling of that survey? Um, Michael Moser from UVM has all of the um, methodology that went behind that. I don't want to misrepresent that. Um, so I can actually ask him to contact oh, the chair. Was there more than, was there more than a thousand people surveyed or 2000? I'm not sure. I don't know. They're, they're in charge of conducting, you know, very credible surveys for a number of different um, interest groups and stakeholders. So I, I don't want to misrepresent their survey met methodology, but it's, it's University of Vermont okay. Center for Rural Studies. So I, I trust them. Could you tell me how widely it was distributed? The survey questions? Yes. Uh, I, why don't I send you what I have from Michael Moser from UVM that includes some of the methodology. And then if you wanna ask him more direct questions, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you. He's actually talked to uh, Lewis Porter and the prior uh, president of the Vermont Trappers Association who sat on the Fish and Wildlife Board uh, who contested the results of the survey. He has all of the answers. I just, I, I don't have them. It's not my area of specialty. Yeah. We Yeah, I'm sure you know, if you send it to the committee, we'd, 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 we'd be glad to uh, take, take, take a look at it. Certainly, Absolutely. I would. And the other question I had was about the uh, bear hounding. And I'm wondering if, uh, short of banding it, if you would, if you thought about whether or not a change of season might uh, solve or resolve some of the uh, issues you raise. 
We're always willing to compromise. Um, there was a bill uh, that I testified in front of the Senate last year, uh, the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Um, I mean, right now it's very concerning um, that the hound training season starts on June 1st, where you are in where they are unleashing untrained hounds into the woods at a time of year when you know deer are birthing and and ground nesting birds, and it's just uh, it's really a disaster. I don't know what, a, what other way to put it. Um, we would like to see bear hounding banned outright, um, but we're always open for discussions. And we've tried having those discussions before um, with other stakeholder groups. Um, so I, I would be happy to continue those conversations um, if the committee feels that it would be the right path to pursue. Uh, thank you. Yes, and just one more, if I may, uh, Madam Chair. Um, on the wanton waste bill, um, say I'm a camp owner and I've got a porcupine chewing away at my outhouse. And so I shot it because I didn't want it around anymore. And, it, and, it, and more than one, uh, basically, there's never just one. Right. Um, if this bill was to, if this, if this wanton waste uh, bill was to go into effect, would I be doing something illegal if I did not take care or bury the porcupine? No, you'd be able to address that. Absolutely. You'd be comfortable with, I just left it. Uh, the Watt and Waste Bill, um, as okay. far as- It's good to know. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, Representative Smith. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for coming in this morning and uh, my question has to do uh, with hunting. What um, what types of hunting and hunting seasons uh, do you uh, you support or recommend? For bear, or no, for any species. Yeah, I mean, our position is you know taking a wild animal for subsistence um, with respect for the life taken is something that we support, and we wouldn't have hunters who are members and hunters who testified alongside us uh, in front of Chair Sheldon a couple of years ago, um, if we were broadly anti-hunting. Um, we believe that black bears are a keystone species in Vermont. Um, they function as a predator on our landscape and they should be protected. Um, and we do have concerns about uh, the number of bears that were killed. We killed off 20% of our bear population last year. And I think we killed off about 10% of our deer herd. So um, yeah, we have concerns with, with bears. Yeah, well, with the, uh, the bears, and uh, I don't know what the numbers are, but you say about 20%, um, but we're seeing a substantial increase in the number of bears in the <laughs> state. So what, what is the right percentage? Well, Forrest Hammond, who I'm, I'm thankful to have um, the ability to contact whenever I need to, uh, we disagree on a lot, but he's always willing to answer my questions. I mean, the bear population was the highest, I think back in 2010, we were at about 7,000 bears. So right now we don't have more bears. We have bears uh, that are changing their range. We have bears um, that are coming into residential areas. Um, but it's, it's not a bear overpopulation problem. It is a, uh, a social caring capacity issue. You know, how many bears are people willing to live with? And that's one thing that we really promote is, you know, how do we be better bear neighbors? You know, how do we act more responsibly um, and manage our food attraction so bears don't end up in residential areas? So we don't have more bears on the landscape than we did 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, we have one more representative Morgan. I just want to be aware of time. We have witnesses waiting and, um, another topic to cover, but go ahead. Good morning. And thank you. Uh, I would just like to follow up on representative, uh, Smith's comments. Do you support hunting of bear? Uh, I, I understand you don't, you don't, to. uh, want the hounding, but do you support the hunting of bear with the uh, use of a bow? We don't, we don't oppose bow hunting at all for any species. 
uh, we do have concerns about the amount of bears that are being taken right now and their inability to reproduce quickly. So um, we, we do not oppose uh, using bows, no. Okay, so bows and, and rifles are fine then. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming in, um, Ms. Galdenzi, and um, also for your <laughs> thorough and timely um, testimony. I appreciate it.